Hello, I'm Patrick Holpert. This is a brief introduction to classical theories of uh, growth and development with a focus on the Lewis two-sector model, a structural change model. Uh, before the Lewis two-sector model, we had that uh, a lot of people believed in the Rostow stages of growth uh, model over here. And uh, the, the Rostow stages were five of them. Uh, first, there was a traditional, which was based on subsistence uh, agriculture. And then there was a preconditions to take off. And then we had a takeoff uh, stage, and this is the most important thing. And Rasta says that you have to uh, invest in order to grow, and he tried to explain the, the move from uh, traditional agriculture to modern industry. And the last two stages were a drive to maturity as well as mass consumption. We're not very interested in these right now. However, we are interested in trying to explain the take-off stage that Rostov has uh, had discussed. So the first one was to uh, understand or explain how investment happens, and the harrod dumar model provided the answer to that one. And the famous harrod dumar equation was that the change in output was equal to the net national savings rate divided by, by the capital output ratio. And if we had depreciation, we might add that as well. So basically what Harold DeMar said was if you want to grow for the entire economy, all you needed to do was to save. And if you didn't save enough, then the foreign aid could, uh, could fill that financing gap, and that could help with growth as well. But what we want to do today is to talk about the Lewis two-sector model, which tried to explain how industrialization occurs. How does an economy move from being based on agriculture to being based or more, uh, having more of an important factor in terms of modern industry. The Lewis two-sector model, just like the Rostov stages of growth and Harold DeMar model, is based on capital accumulation. Uh, instead of having just one sector, the entire economy, uh, the Lewis model is a little bit disaggregated. So we have one traditional agricultural sector and we have one modern industrial industry sector. So we have two industries in this model. The two key things that we need to understand and really think about when we talk about the Lewis two-sector model is first, that we, there is an assumption of surplus labor. This was true for the Harry DeMar model as well, but surplus labor here is that there are a lot of workers, more workers than we really need in the agricultural sector and uh, so whenever we need workers in the modern industrial sector, they can just go from the agricultural sector over to the uh, modern in industrial sector. And because there is surplus labor, the marginal product of labor in this uh, agricultural sector is equal to zero. So when they leave, agricult agricultural output stays exactly the same. The second big uh, assumption that we have is that all profits made by the capital owners are going to be reinvested into new capital. And that is, in fact, how capital accumulation occurs. So whenever they uh, make some money, they're just going to buy more capital and therefore put in motion some mechanisms that lead to sustainable economic growth. So uh, here we have the traditional agricultural sector. Let me just uh, try to explain this a little bit. So the first thing we see here is that, once again, we assume that there is surplus labor. And what that means in terms of this diagram over here is that we are over here somewhere. So therefore, we can see that the marginal product of labor is equal to zero. So even so, as we reduce number of workers, the total product of uh, producing the agricultural sector will stay exactly the same. There will not be any change at all. And when we see here, with these number of workers, because this is not a non-competitive industry, that is that the real wage of the agricultural worker is not equal to the marginal product of labor, which of course makes sense, because if it was, uh, they would starve because the marginal product of labor is zero, so they wouldn't get anything. So instead, the real wage is determined by the average product of labor. What we can think of here is that they're family farms, they produce output, and then they share that output equally among all the family members. So everybody gets the average. 
So this is the agricultural setup. It's pretty straightforward. Again, the important part is that we have surplus labor over here, and therefore, as we move workers out of the agricultural industry and into modern industry or agricultural sector, uh, total product of ag agriculture stays exactly the same. Next, we look at the modern industry. The modern industry is characterized by competitive markets. So here's the, the modern product of labor is going to be greater than zero, and the real wage will be equal to the modern product of labor, just like we have in, uh, in competitive markets. Again, I remind you that the, the big uh, uh, assumption for the modern industry is that all profits will be reinvested into new capital. And that's how capital accumulation occurs. And when we have capital accumulation, that's going to lead to sustainable growth. In fact, uh, we can, well, we're going to tell the story in a second here, but you can see that as the new capital is introduced, the total product curve is going to shift up. The market product of labor is going to increase as well. They want to hire more workers. Those workers will come from the, the agricultural sector. And you have this perfectly elastic supply of labor here. And the reason it's perfectly elastic is because that's just surplus workers coming, entering into uh, the modern sector. And you don't have to pay them any more because they just keep coming as long as we need them in this industry. And uh, of course, as we add more and more, uh, total product curve will start shifting up higher and higher. We increase here, and therefore we can hire more and more people in the modern industry. I'm going to tell this story a little bit more carefully in the next slide. All right, so here we have, have uh, the basic outline of the story. So right now, I'm looking at the modern industry. And we have our, the modern total product curve for the modern industry. And we have the demand and supply for labor, and how, that's how the real wage is determined. So importantly, we're starting out here that right now, uh, we, uh, the demand for labor, which is equal to the marginal product of labor in the modern industry, is, is given by this uh, downward sloping uh, curve right there. Right, so we have it right there. Again, the supply of labor is perfectly elastic because workers are just coming from the, the surplus labor in the agricultural sector, so they just keep coming. And in the background here, we have, you know, that the total product produced in the agricultural sector is just, uh, we're going to just add that to, to our total product, the entire economy. But right now we can see that given this, this setup here, uh, if we just go up a little bit, we can figure out what total product in the modern industry is equal to. And uh, so that's what this number is. Add the agricultural output, which is just constant, and you can f find out what the total product is in the entire uh, economy. All right, so the question now is, what happens? Well, first of all, we have this total product being produced by these number of workers, LM1, but uh, all these workers are going to get paid the real wage, which is equal to WM. Uh, and therefore, we can see that the area WM, B, LM1, 0, that is this rectangle right here, this is the wage bill. This is the uh, the amount of money that goes to the workers. But total output is actually made up of the marginal product of each labor. So if we add up total output, we get this uh, trapezoid. And you notice there is uh, one uh, area left there. There's A, B, W, M. So if I fill that in here with blue, this little triangle here, that's the amount of output or income that goes to the capital owners. So the capital owners get this. Okay, what, what are the capital owners going to do with that uh, uh, profit? Well, the whole point of this, or the, a big part of the story, is that they're going to reinvest it. So when they reinvest that profit, they're going to have more capital. So 
for in this next period, our capital is going to be KM1 plus the profit. Let's call that pi. So we're going to have more profit, or that's equal to the change in capital. And what that's going to do is going to shift up our total product curve. So the total product curve is going to be here, given the new greater amount of capital. You can see that for any level of, out, uh, of workers here, the, the new total product curve, the production function here, is going to get steeper. So what we have here is really that our marginal product to labor curve, or our demand for labor, is actually going to be shifting out. Now the capital owners, given that they now are making, uh, well, workers are more productive and therefore they can make more profit, they want to hire some more workers. And what they do, again, is uh, hire workers up until the real wage is equal to the marginal product labor. So we can find that they want to hire workers up to the LM2 over there. All right, so this is the number of new workers we have. We can go up and we can see that they will actually produce more output here now in the modern industry. Uh, we see also that uh, uh, this total output is going to be shared by between the workers and the uh, uh, capital owners. The workers get this rectangle over here and uh, the capital owners get this bigger triangle over here. What are they going to do with that triangle? Well, once again, whatever profit they make, the capital owners are just going to reinvest it. So the profit made is just going to become a change in the capital stock. The change in capital stock will then be reinvested, right? Or it's going to increase the, the production function. It's going to shift out the market product of labor. It's going to hire. They're going to hire more workers. They're going to produce more output. They're going to make more money, and they're going to keep reinvesting that until, well, I don't know, until they run out of workers, until they run out of surplus labor from the agricultural sector. But this is going to be the, basically the end of the story here. You can see that this will just keep going. This will be sustainable growth until we run out of the. Uh, the total, I mean the surplus workers from the agricultural sector. Notice here that the total product, which is equal to TPM, which is increasing, plus the TPA, which is staying constant because we have surplus labor and the amount of product of labor in the agricultural sector is zero. So the total product here is going to increase, but our number of workers, you know, remember L is just equal to you know, the number of workers in the agriculture sector plus the number of workers in the modern industry. So L here stays the same, so this one is the same, whereas this one is increasing, which means that the per capita income, or output per person, is definitely going to be increasing. And that is, of course, what we mean when we say we have economic growth. All right, so let me just recap here. So according to the Lewis two-sector model, we will have economic growth, we'll have capital accumulation because we add more and more, we reinvest the profit into new capital, and we will see uh, a greater amount or a bigger share of modern industry in a total output. And of course, uh, that makes sense too. Let me just go over here. It's going to be a little, it's getting a little uh, crowded here, but uh, you can see that the total product for the divided by, you know, agriculture sector divided by total product for the entire economy, since the total product is increasing, whereas the output for agriculture sector stays exactly the same, the share of agriculture is falling, whereas the, the total product in the modern sector, in this industry, uh, that one is increasing faster than uh, total product in the economy, because total product in the economy is that increase plus nothing. And therefore, we can see that the share of modern industry is actually increasing in this economy. Well, that's a very brief and very quickly, uh, very quick uh, explanation of the Lewis two-sector model. There are lots of uh, problems with this one. I, won't, I don't want to spend too much on that right now, but I will mention that 
uh, well, f here's two. One, is it, does it make sense that the capital owners will actually reinvest the profit in their own industry? For example, if you have capital flight, maybe they take that money and put it in Switzerland, then this will just stop and we'll have no growth. Another pro possibility is that they do uh, invest the profit, but they invest it in labor-saving technology. That is, they don't use the same technology, which needs a lot of workers. Instead, they might start uh, uh, investing in labor-saving. And if we did that, one could show that they will make even more profits in the future. That is, they will, of total output, they will take a greater share. So that little, this triangle we have over here, with labor saving technology, that triangle is going to be a little bit bigger. So we have assumed that all profits are reinvested and uh, they don't invest in labor saving technology. And of course, the assumption of surplus labor in the agricultural sector is simply not true in the real world. Anyway, I hope this has been somewhat helpful. Thank you very much.